good morning, everyone. As people hop on, I can watch them uh, logging in here. I wanted to welcome you this to this week's edition of our biweekly update. Today, Zach will be in APFA, and so he will not be here today for Zach's facts. So we're just going to skip over any facts and make everything up today. So uh, with that, actually, uh, I will have Ashley join us for Zach's facts and helping us uh, save some money with some money saving ideas. So today we want to open with going big or positive focus, whatever you'd like to call it. So for me, it's a wonderful spring is here weekend, um, having quite a few things to do with uh, Samantha winning a literary award for the state in her grade. Uh, she got second to spending time uh, just over the weekend with family, doing things outside, being relatively around Milwaukee for a weekend is wonderful. So how about uh, Ken? Yeah, thank you, Chris. Good morning, everybody. Great to be with you all today. And yeah, great for uh, my daughter had her first communion over this last weekend. So a good, uh, you know, based on our beliefs and our family, it was a great, it was a great moment for the family, for the kids and everything like that. So, and uh, just a great support of the community as well around that. So just wanted to be grateful for that and hand it back to you. Thank you very much. How about Michael? <clears throat> Chris, um, you know, I'm really grateful for just the time I was able to spend with my family this last Sunday. Um, you know, my grandfather, my Nana, they both were able to come over. My parents went out of their way to pick them up. Um, they're in their 90s at this point, so it's difficult for them to get around without a little bit of help. Um, so both my parents drove in opposite directions to grab them, brought them back to, uh, to their house, and we all got to spend a really great day together. So grateful for that, grateful for the weather. I'm grateful for her aloe, get a little bit of burn in my back, so. Awesome. Thank you, Mike. Um, how about Ian? How about Ashley? Thank you, Chris. Good morning. I am grateful for the wonderful weather that we're having, as well as just community. I am a soccer mom to two boys, so any day outside on a field that is warm and friends and just people new that we get to meet is a great day. Perfect. How about Angie? Thank you, Chris. Um, I am also grateful for the beautiful weather. I bought the first of my flowers yesterday, so that's always an exciting time for me. Um, so getting ready to start planting those and watching them bloom throughout the summer. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Well, with that, of course, it's beautiful to have this nice spring day. We had our spring forum just this last week as well. It was great to see many of you to go over a lot of uh, subjects really in, in depth. Uh, since then, I've, I've read another book or two, and I've got some different pieces I can pull from from those. I don't want to hit you with some heavy human bias issues and stuff right away. So instead, what I thought I would do is Lisa bought me a wonderful calendar, and it's a calendar of dad jokes every day, as if I need more ammunition. But I thought this was pretty good. You know, coming up, we're going to be planting a garden. So I thought I'd ask you, what's a scarecrow's favorite fruit? Strawberries. Yeah, you're right. That's a good one. So a few of those I'll be whistling through here on the way as you go uh, as you go forward because there's some really good ones here um, as a, as we have a little bit of humor injected that you can now use with your grandchildren or not use at all and just scoff at. That's really up to you. A couple of very important things we've seen lately are uh, around the behavior of humans. For instance, uh, uh, you guys all know humans, don't you? Yeah, I see you all. Um, shaking your heads with your coffee up, you know humans. So the one thing I know about humans, do you know any humans that do anything really weird? Maybe something irrational? Oh, oh yeah, not me, but I know a lot of other people who do. Yeah, I see that answer. Um, but the key with the markets, the markets is the biggest barometer you can find of human behavior. So what happens with a lot of us is we get myopic in our focus. Now, what does that mean? I really don't know what it means. It sounds good. So I had to look it up. Basically, myopic means very short focused. So we look at what's happening right now and think we should do something with it. So when we get really myopic, when we get really short sighted in our thinking, we make decisions different than we would make if we were considering our long term plan. We have the faith, patience and discipline to follow things and things that a lot of people bring up that are, oh, my gosh, did you hear about this today? We may or may not have. But if it doesn't move the needle to our plan long term, we notice it. We wait stoically to see what's going on, monitor it. And then we'll make a decision many times to discontinue on our plan and not make a major adjustment. Most of what it is we do is nothing. Did you hear what I just said? Yeah, most of what we do seems like nothing. 
but it is everything. It's sticking true to your plan. So as we go through to that, as we heard today, for instance, I'm not sure if you uh, were on the news, hopefully you weren't, but inflation is easing to 4.9%, significantly less than last year, um, in some cases near half of what it was. We're seeing quite a few issues coming up with jobs, people finding jobs, not as many, there's some layoffs, but we still have a major issue with finding enough employees as well. I think there's a couple of things like gaming stocks are up as they're talking about working with AI. The nice thing we're finding about AI is an incredibly wonderful tool, just like when you got your Oculus Rift glasses. You ever get your first virtual reality glasses, you put them on, you're like, oh, excited. Oh, yeah, it's going to be great. You put them on and then you're watching like a roller coaster, like you're somewhere and then you have them on for 10 minutes and you feel a bit queasy. Well, that's very similar. Um, you, you, there's a lot of stuff going on right now. Let me kind of bring this back to a lot of stuff going on right now that maybe isn't as important to your long-term plan, but we're monitoring it. Inflation's one. The war uh, still going on with Ukraine is another as well. Um, there's many things going on with markets. Markets are kind of in an interesting spot here. They're meandering back and forth because there's an alternative right now called cash that is yielding darn near 5%. It'll probably move down with inflation as well, but at least right now it's 5%. And rather than sitting in stocks, not knowing what's going on, if we have a short-term focus, we like cash, right? But long-term, as stocks are compressed longer and longer, the longer that goes, that spring is really compressed. And at some point it's gonna pop. We can't tell you when, it just historically has. So we're patient in waiting for that. The longer this goes, the more frustration there is. But we do also know that the more risk there is, the more up and downs, three bear markets in the last five years, Risk typically equals what? Return. So with that myopic focus, our goal is to stretch out the longer term focus. To some of you might say, Chris, I'm, I'm retired. Um, I know, remember, when you retire, life just gets started, by the way. There's a lot that happens in retirement. You have more knowledge than you ever had, typically more money, maybe less energy, but now you've got all the freedom you possibly could have as well. So uh, just wanted to really touch on a few different topics in retirement. We won't touch on every single one because this would be another webinar, another seminar that would last, you know, an hour and a half or two hours. But I wanted to just touch on a few of those important pieces as well. And some of the effects of technology, maybe I'll touch on a bit later in the program today. Um, so let's, why don't we throw it over to Zach's facts. Zach? That's funny. I just like doing that. Uh, why don't we bring it over first to uh, Ashley? Ashley, why don't you help us? I'm going to have to rename or name yours. I haven't come up with something on the fly here, but um, Ashley Savers moment. That doesn't sound quite right. We'll figure it out. Thank you, Chris. Today, I just want to point out your wallet. So again, no need to go out and get a new credit card offer. Instead, check what's in your wallet currently. There's lots of offers from your credit card that you may not be aware of, including travel benefits. Did you know that if something happens on an airplane that some credit cards offer life insurance? Most people do not. So obviously they're not making lots of claims on those, but that is something to look into. If your bag is lost during a trip and you are obviously without clothes and belongings, there's a hundred to $200 a day credit allowed by some of these credit cards that you can recoup your things. And obviously you're not out personally for those options or those items that you're in need of. So also check out, sorry. There's airplane perks. A lot of airplanes have discounted prices through credit cards like American Express, Chase cards. There's perks such as daily breakfast for two if you wanna book through a hotel chain that your credit card is synced up with. Late checkout up to 4 p.m. I had no idea, so I thought that was a very interesting thing. If you have a late flight, you utilize that credit card offer and get that late checkout. There's lots of things, including shopping discounts. There might be stores that you're already utilizing, and they have offers such as get $25 statement credit if you spend $75, again, at a store that you might already be shopping at. So take a look at those. And also entertainment. Did you know that you could get early access to some tickets, including concerts, plays? So double check your credit card offers and maybe you can utilize some new things and take advantage of what they're offering you for free. And again, that credit card may be already in your wallet. Back to you, Chris. Thank you. What's in your wallet? I just wanted to say that because it kind of so was one of those fun things. I don't have the deep booming voice that the gentleman has, but that was kind of interesting. You know, Mike and I were just talking the other day and he said, Chris, why, uh, why can't humans hear the sound of a dog whistle? And I said to Mike, dogs can whistle? 
anyway, um, we were, it was kind of a fun conversation and we kind of led on from there. We started talking about the bird buddy as well. A um, couple of things I want to introduce you to since I've got a little extra time without Zach's facts. Uh, and today, I guess, is a fiction. Maybe it's our fiction day since there's no Zach's facts. Um, but I wanted to talk about what we call a word called satisficing. Have you heard of it? I think it's a made up word until I found it satisficing. So most people when making a decision, today I wanna, to, I'll talk a little bit after uh, Ken and Mike on decision-making and how we can do it, maybe a better frame for doing it. But satisficing is actually a word that I learned recently, which is a lot of times you will talk about a decision and you'll hem and haw and hem and haw and a whole bunch of conversation about a whole bunch of energy you lose on it and it lose sleep and days and days. Well, satisficing is making a decision that you're satisfied with, but not completely. You're okay with this as a minimum result. That way, you put it aside, you're okay, you don't have the frustration after it happens if it's not perfect. Satisficing is actually a wonderful state of mind to say, that's not an important decision. I'm going to call small decisions little Ds. Should the mom be mowed to now, this afternoon, or tomorrow? That's a small D. Should I move into an assisted living or a senior living facility? Should I help my, my parents you know, um, with some major health decision? Those are big Ds. Those are big decisions. So satisficing is a good one for lose for, to use for a lot of small Ds, and in some cases, a very good idea when two of you don't agree on the big decisions as well. So I wanted to introduce the word satisficing to you. It might be something that's very helpful and useful in making better, more effective decisions. With that, I'd like to take it over to Mike's couple of minutes because Zach is gone. A <laughs> couple of minutes. I'll take it. I'll take it. Thanks, Chris. So, you know, to just kind of reinforce some of the things that Chris was saying earlier about doing nothing. And, you know, what we truly mean by that is to be rational with your decisions when something is happening overall. And a lot of times the most rational thing to do is stick to the plan. You know, there's different planning things that we can do when it comes to a recessionary period or any sort of swing in the market. It doesn't really matter if there's things that are always changing, which is the one thing that is guaranteed. There's different planning practices and different things we can implement, whether that's taking advantage of higher interest rates, or looking at doing something like a Roth conversion. But anyways, when I touch on the markets, we do find it extremely interesting what happens during the short term because it does reinforce why we maintain this long-term philosophy and we don't react to things that have happened previously. So looking at the S&P 500 year to date, it's up about 7.8%. NASDAQ 100, or the NASDAQ composite is up about 17%. Now, both of those are still about 12 to 15% below the all-time highs that they had previously set. So that still offers a great investment opportunity, but reinforces why we talk about during times of decline in the market, putting money to work because it gives an opportunity. No matter how high interest rates are, stocks have always outperformed over the long term. So that's something to continue to remember. I mean, interest rates have been higher than they are right now, and stocks still, when you look at the long-term perspective, have outperformed. I'm looking at the small cap stocks, that's just over zero on the year. It's actually 0.03%. Uh, the Dow is up 1.4%. And then turning our attention to the overseas, the overseas developed is up about 10.2%. And the emerging markets is up about 2.7% year to date. Now, inside of those indices, there's things that have outperformed. And we've actually watched emerging markets actively manage mutual funds do extremely well year to date and over the last six months, which is something that's very exciting to see because they did not have a good three prior years to that. So the other thing that I did want to touch on is the idea between active and passive management. And active management is where you truly have somebody who's making some decisions based upon parameters that are set on how they choose what's invested in. A passive man or, or a passive management strategy is send, setting something similar to an index where they just pick a bunch of stuff to start and they allow that to continue to run. Now, all of these different management philosophies can be based in separate sectors, but what we've really noticed with the volatility that's happened year to date and over the course of truly the last, you know, three years since COVID, it's been a very, very interesting time period. We've started to really see active management shine in the, in the short term, which is something that we would like to see and we believe will continue to see long term because of the fact that they're able to make decisions. They're not locked into where they are. So even though you're staying true to your plan and it might feel like you're doing nothing, something is always happening. So thank you, Chris. Chris, I believe you're still muted. I would uh, I would try to translate, but I'm not not one for reading lips. 
I was simply speaking in mine. Thank you, Mike. So as we go through, sometimes I like to test you guys because reading lips is a, is a wonderful kind of a thing. So I thought I would share that. So as we go forward here, I want to bring up my, uh, Ken's corner in just a minute as well here. Uh, but as we talk about that, decision-making uh, ideas as well are really big. We're making decisions because if you choose not to decide, you'll still have made a choice. Oftentimes we make big decisions or more importantly, we don't make big decisions, right? We just let them go and whatever happens, happens. Well, that's a decision as well. So sometimes the empathetic, the maybe I'm going to call the lazy person's decision is to do nothing about it. And sometimes that's exactly right. So as we go through, I just want to make sure people understand that. There's some more framework I'm going to put around this after uh, Ken's corner. So I'll see what he says, then I'll make some correction. No, I'm just joking. I'll, I'll talk more about decision making as well, Ken. Ken, what's going on? What, what should we talk about in planning? I know you're just out with Ed, uh, Mr. Slot. What's going on that we need to know about in the planning picture? Yeah, I appreciate that, Chris. And maybe we'll have to make a few corrections after I say something. That I know, but, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, but yeah, well, one one thing, uh, one question I've been asking some of you is, you know, how did you get started investing? Like, like what, what did that look like 30 years ago, 40 years ago, right? And it really comes down to uh, someone was most likely an advocate for you. You know, you when you started a, a company at a company and it was maybe a 401k, maybe there were some savings available. It was that one person who was like in their 60s that sat you down and said, you need to put money into your 401k plan, right? You might, we all have someone that was influential in our life that said something to us that hopefully motivated us to save some money somewhere, somehow. You guys all have those stories. They're awesome to hear. A lot of it is $50 a month, and that's how it started. $100 a month, that's how it started. And next thing you know, you have these large IRAs that you've accumulated over your lifetime. My, my, my advice, if I could offer any to you right now, be an advocate for somebody. A lot of times we think that everyone has it figured out and, you know, we assume that, oh, it looks like they have their life together. It looks like they're doing a good job, but you know what? Someone needs to be an advocate for somebody if they don't have it in their life. So, you know, a lot of you are great investors. A lot of you are retired already for a long period of time. You have so much wisdom that you could offer some young person to give them a fighting chance when it comes to a retirement of what they hope for someday. So I really want to just bring that to your attention because I've been I've been learning about your stories and they're so powerful that sometimes you don't even know that they're that powerful. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention. The other piece I want to talk about is, yeah, there are some stuff with the Secure Act uh, pieces. I'm looking at the, the people that are on the call right now. I know some people watch it later. Um, th there's a lot to be determined yet. So I'm a little reluctant just to jump into a few things, even though things are going to change. Because sometimes when we're at these seminars, uh, you know, Ed Slot will be up there providing all this information and he goes, but that may happen. So I'm like, well, did that happen? Did it not happen? So sometimes we get clouded on what's really happening and not happening. So I'll come back to that piece. But I want to talk about health savings account just briefly, because these are coming up quite a bit in, in the meetings I'm in uh, that Chris is in as well. And I want to talk about health savings account, if I can, just for a, a moment here. I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully you can see this, uh, the HSA charts. Uh, Chris or Mike, can you nod your head that you can see it, please? Excellent. That's good. Here's the 200, uh, 200, 2023 health savings account chart. Uh, we call it the purple chart. This is very helpful for some of you that have HSAs. The questions come around, do I have one? Am I eligible for one? If I have one, what do I do with it? Do I put money into it? Do I max it out? When do I use it? What can I use it for? These are all questions that come up. Uh, should I invest it or not? So here's some contribution limits that you may see. So if you are eligible and have a health savings account uh, through your employer, uh, here are some of the um, amounts of money that you can put into them based on your based on your scenario. Okay, um, call us if you have questions. We have great partners in this area that can help us out as well. But these are really, really probably one of the most advantageous places to put money because they go in tax free regardless of your income, which is really nice. If you invest it, they actually can grow tax-free. And then when you use them for qualified expenses, guess what they are? They're tax-free as well. So not, you get the trifecta you know, effect with these type of accounts called HSAs, health savings accounts. A little different than flex spending accounts. Those were a use it or lose it program. This is a continuation of this. So ask your kids, ask your grandkids, hey, do you have an HSA available to you by chance at work? They'd be like, well, maybe. 
because this is one area where money should be going into most likely, but again, it based on their scenario, but this is a pretty advantageous bucket. There are other things we can do like, for example, I'm kind of scrolling through here quickly, but you can look at here, you can actually make a one-time transfer from an IRA into an HSA. Uh, that's kind of a little known rule there as well. Um, portability you know, of, of H HSAs, investments. We, you know, some plans allow for investments to like to grow the money, some plans don't. So these are all pieces that we have to evaluate when it comes to health savings. Hey, account. Ken, so, yes. Ken, I have a question for you. So if I'm a retiree, I recently retired, I retired five or six years ago. Um, do I have a, is there much of a chance that I have a high deductible health plan? Is there much of a chance that I can contribute to an HSA or not? There can be. It depends. If you're already retired, it depends yeah. if you're on, if you're on Medicare already, most likely not. Okay. Because once you're on Medicare, that's one of the qualifying events of a high deductible plan. But mm -hmm. what, if you're retired and you have one, what you, what we can figure out is how do we use it and what can we use it for? Mm -hmm. You know, part B, part D, uh, advantage plan premiums. You can't use the HSA for what we call Medigap or supplemental plans for the premiums, but you can certainly use it for three or four other pieces, co-pays, co-insurance, you know, that, that you're that you're on the hook for, right? So these are all things that we can use it from a meta, from a retiree standpoint to help uh, offset some of those out-of-pocket costs that we may be incurring. Outstanding. Thank you, Ken. I appreciate it. I got five or six other questions, but I don't want to take up all our time asking personal questions on high deductible health plans. So, <laughs> well, thank uh, you for that. <laughs> thank you. No, I appreciate that. We'll talk. You know, Ken and I were actually golfing this weekend. And uh, what's kind of funny is he was looking at these trees and one was a weeping willow. He goes, you know, Chris, that, that weeping willow looks kind of sad. I said, well, maybe it watched a sappy movie. So at any rate, uh, I know that's good. I love that. I was okay. hoping for that kind of elicited response. <laughs> so let me hop into something here as well. There's something we're going to talk about another time called money scripts. Uh, Ken touched on a subject that I'm very passionate about, and I've been putting a lot of work together in it, as well as one of my friends, Ron Nakamoto. Did you realize that over 60% of Americans don't talk about money? Why? It's called money scripts. What have you learned at some point in your history? that makes it uncomfortable to talk about money, money avoidance, money's bad. You must've heard something at some point. And a lot of times until you examine it, you're not even sure what it is. So that'll be something we'll talk about in another program, maybe a whole program in and of itself. But what I wanted to just talk on real quick here was decision-making. Let me give you a quick idea on decision-making and then I'll pass it over to the super important person today, which is Angie talking about um, what's going on here at Gentian we should pay attention to. So there's a couple of different items here. In, there's about eight steps if you look at major decisions and the way we make decisions here. Um, and this is a process, process I often use. I don't really make it public that often, but these eight steps to this uh, are very, very important. And I'll, I'll show you why. First of all, we take the big decision and we frame the decision. And the first step is to identify the problems and articulate the decision to be made. So let's just use as a sample. Okay, I'm gonna retire. That's a pretty big decision, right? I call that a big D. So remember at retirement, Life begins. That's the way I see it, because that's what we're here helping you begin life and retirement. So life begins. Now you're free. You can do anything you want. And sometimes that's really good. And sometimes that's really scary. But here's a big decision, right? Two, um, discern what matters. So for me, my wife, my girls, my mom, family, um, the team here, community, what list them in importance. And so when you're making this decision, have in the side of the paper the things that are most important to you fitness, health, whatever those are, but you can always use those as a frame as you're looking at this decision. Does it strengthen these relationships? Does it strengthen these things that are, are important? So the dis discern what matters is number two. Number three is generate options. What are your choices? Stay working, work part-time, never work again, leave immediately. Um, there's probably an iteration of 15 or 20 different things inside there as well. So generate the different options that are available. And then you can start to weigh those against those things that were important as well. Uh, I'm going to retire and move to Florida. Well, that's great, except your wife and family might want you around here still. Um, those kind of things you want to take a look at as well. I had a guy say that one time. We were in a meeting. He goes, yeah, hey, I'm going to retire and move to Florida. He said, wow, that's going to be lonely, his wife said sitting there. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was really funny. She said it really quick and really... I don't know. She's pretty serious, actually, I thought. But then uh, explore the consequences. Part of what I just said was exploring the consequences. That's step number four. Weigh the trade-offs. Now, I'm giving you just brief descriptions of these. Then number six, decide. Implement this decision. And then 
monitor and feedback. So implement this monitor feedback is step number seven. Now that's an important one. Many people make a decision, they just move on. They never really look back at them. Was it good? Was it bad? How's it working? You can redecide. You can decide. I've had people move to Florida. Their entire family's here. They have grandkids. Their health care's here. Their life is really still here. They moved back from Texas or Florida because they decided this is home. That was interesting. Remember, something is very appealing about vacation. You typically have no responsibility there. So it's not so much the location. It's the location in your mind, the destination that you've achieved, which is complete freedom and lack of uh, responsibility. That can be anywhere. But oftentimes, that's why you buy a vacation property. So you're thinking, oh, this is great. I want to feel like this all the time. Well, once you get there, you bring everything in your problems with you once it becomes yours. So you got to work on yourself. Number eight, stay curious and learn. So this eight-step decision-making process we look at here, I don't want to call it unique. I'll say I borrowed it as well from, from a friend. Even uh, um, There's a lot of decisions that go around this, but most importantly, the key is keeping what's important at the center. It's my wife, my relationship with her, my daughters, the relationship with them. Like, should I move and follow them around to college? Maybe. Oh, except that when they're done, they might transfer colleges. Oh, they might actually go start working in another city. What if I move my whole life to where they were in college? What are the issues? So again, I just want to offer that to you because sometimes I know around decisions, we just make decisions on the fly. You may have considered this stuff, but sometimes the big Ds, the big decisions are worth taking that extra time and writing it down. Small Ds are, should I mow the lawn tomorrow? Um, you know, should I beat Ken golfing next week or something like that? Those are small Ds, small decisions. <laughs> so I'm just well, kidding. Well, Chris, beating me golfing is going to be an easy decision for you. Oh, so. come on now. No, no, it's a lot of work. Man. I'm um, but thank you. I just wanted to offer that to you guys as maybe a helpful way to make big decisions because a lot of them are facing you from your parents to your kids to yourselves. Here's a framework we can even work more with over time and have maybe a specific module that I'll record on this showing you the actual stages and giving you some of the pages, maybe giving you a PDF with some decision-making tools as well, if you guys find that appealing. So I know it helps me in making some of the bigger decisions I have, because I tend to think I have a knowing for most of those. Um, with that, what I'd like to do, though, is pass it over to Angie. And what is super important for us to know about that's happening at Gentian, um, because I like to listen, and this is where I get cued into what's happening as well. Thanks, Chris. Uh, first off, we're going to start with Ken Flannery. This Friday is his birthday. So we wa just want to make sure that we say happy birthday and celebrate him this Friday. So happy birthday, Ken. Uh, next Wednesday is going to be our third book club on how to win friend, friends and influence people. Um, Chris will be hosting that and we will be going through pages one through 52. Um, feel free to register even if you hadn't had a chance to read the book um, or you're not caught up um, up to page 52. Please join us for the conversation. Um, you're always welcome and we would love to have you join in on that. Uh, next bi-weekly update is going to be Wednesday, May 24th. Um, that's also going to be followed by our May birthday club. Again, check the newsletter in the bulletin to register for that. Uh, Monday, May 29th is uh, Memorial Day, so the markets and our office will be closed to kick off the summer season. Wednesday um, also will be um, Women's Health and Wealth, which will be Our Ladies and Gentian. Uh, Michelle Norris, who most of you are familiar with, who hosted our Health and Wealth series yesterday, who did a phenomenal job, some great information in there, um, some great takeaways. Those slides are available, so if you missed that, please reach out and we can get those to you. Uh, Wednesday, May 31st, we will have limited office availability as our team focuses on learning to serve you better. Those hours will be from about noon to 3.30, uh, but rest assured we will reach back to you if you need anything uh, right after that. And on behalf of myself, to all the fellow mothers and grandmothers, um, happy Mother's Day this Sunday. I hope you have a wonderful day and enjoy spending time with your family. Thank you very much, Angie. I appreciate that. I wanted to bring up two things I guess I'd forgotten in the beginning about the debt ceiling and a few other items. When you look at what this looming debt ceiling means, and we do think we want more fiscal, um, I guess, more fiscal thought in the process of what we spend in the, in the country. What's interesting, though, is if you ever looked at your balance sheet 
what your house is versus what your mortgage is, the things you own versus what you have debt for. What's really interesting when you look at that on the basis of the United States. So let's say I have a home and I have $200,000 in debt and my home is worth $500,000 and I have some 401k and savings. So I have a, a million dollars of, of net worth and assets and property and things, but I have $200,000 in debt. So that looks pretty good, right? I've got a pretty significant net worth, $800,000. And that's in America, that's one of the top, you know, four or 5%. But when you look at the federal government, people don't look at it that way. They hear the numbers and they look at the trillions of dollars and they see that, you know, we're looking at one times what we produce in the country for our debt. It's, it's just craziness when you start to look at some of these. Like, oh, my gosh. But that narrow framing is that case. When you look at it on a bigger picture, when you look at the assets the federal government home, uh, owns, parks, uh, land, buildings, federal buildings in almost every single state, uh, mass acres of land, actually, we're in decent shape. We're actually, we're in very good shape if you look at it that way. The balance sheet looks good on a balance sheet basis, but it's not ever attacked that way because that's not politically fun. The thing is, I would like better fiscal responsibility. We'd like no debt, right? But there's going to be some debt. We just need to maybe sp quit spending so much and reduce the overall bigger picture. And that's what many people think. Now, I'm, I don't have the solution for it. I just wanted to give you an idea here that we've talked about it. We had some great conversations yesterday with a couple of advisors I know as well. Um, what I want to do here is is thank you all. So uh, uh, Angie mentioned a book club as well that we have here coming up. The book is called How to Win Friends and Influence People, which I actually think is a misnomer. It's from Dale Carnegie from 1920s, but it's been updated along the way. I actually would call it How to Be a Better Human. It's really all about communication. It's about how to communicate in a better way. I think when you say win friends and influence people, you think it's, oh, I'm going to put one over on them. It's absolutely not that. It's ethical conversations. More importantly, how to express yourself in a positive way as well. And as I look at this, if the, in the new era of machine learning and human machine, um, let's call it interaction, also in this instant, instantaneous communication world that we're in, you can communicate more than ever. We're and so since you're connected with everybody, our relationships are better, right? There's less divisiveness. All the sides have come together at some place in the middle and we're all singing Kumbaya, right? Because we're all able to communicate all the time. Oh, wait, what? what's it? We're not? We're, we're farther apart? How's that possible? Oh, because we suck at communication. Ah, yeah, that's true, we do. We as humans aren't good communicators. So why don't we do something that allows us to become better humans, better communicators, and all smart, all our small part some of the books were Love Your Enemies, Strength to Strength. These are ways for us to become better humans so that when interacting, we're more patient. When people are done with a conversation enough, they actually feel uplifted versus beaten down. We're not trying to one-up them. We're helping them feel more important. There's a lot of small uh, tips in here that will help you. I guarantee you don't have to have read the whole book. You don't have to read all 54 pages. I'd love it if you did, but, but we've done it. As we go through it, we're going to pop some of the high points of it. Um, and I really say, if you can join it or join for some of them, please do. It's a wonderful event. We've probably done three of these so far. And I've actually had people say, you know what? I was skeptical when I started, but uh, I got a lot out of it. And then a lot of our clients will use it in their other book clubs with other areas as well. So I just wanted to give that a quick plug. Um, with that, I know I'm five minutes over or more. Zach wasn't here, so I had to go five minutes over. But I want to thank you today. We appreciate if you joined yesterday for the health and wealth. That's the live it side of the equation. A lot of the conversations we've had today are about that as well. The give it is on a consistent basis. We know you tell us all of giving of your time, your energy, attention, resources, and hope to people. That's super important as well. And the base is planning it. So looking at how to make decisions, retirement, making sure we're optimizing it for you. That's what we're here. We're your team for helping you optimize your retirement, which is planning, living, and then giving. With you, I appreciate your time today. Thank you for a little bit of extra time. Uh, and I look forward to you all having a wonderful, wonderful day. Enjoy yourself for the next two weeks. I know you're going to be waiting with bated breath until our next biweekly update. With that, thank you from me here, Chris Doty at Gentium Financial at our headquarters here in Mequon, Wisconsin. <laughs>